Thank you very much indeed, Provost. It's quite an intimidating experience. First of all, I'm shown into a room which is marked the headmaster's study, <laughs> which gives a sense of anxiety to anybody who recalls their school days. Then I find that sitting in the audience is, my, in a sense, my current boss, the treasurer of Gray's Inn, my pupil master, Sir Mark Potter, and my wife. So this is a very intimidating audience. And then you add two million people on the web as well. Uh, at the 2012 uh, International Council for Commercial Arbitration Congress, Sundaresh Menon, then Attorney General and now Chief Justice of Singapore, gave a prize-winning keynote speech. He spoke of the arbitration industry and its critical role in the global administration of commercial justice. He later described arbitration as a free market model of adjudication. And for some, such words may jar because rendering justice shouldn't perhaps be conceived of as an industry. It should be a public service. Although lawyers are financially remunerated, the courts don't overtly operate as profit centers. And except with regard to interstate relations, justice should be devised and applied on a national level, not globally administered. And dispute resolution shouldn't, many would say, be corrupted by market forces. But his description of international arbitration was apt as a wholly consensual dispute resolution mechanism distinct from the public justice system embodied in the national courts and most often shrouded by confidentiality, arbitration is a privatized system of law. Moreover, international arbitration is indubitably a service industry designed and evolving to meet the needs of its key potential consumers corporations, and to a lesser extent, but increasingly, national states. The service providers are the council, the arbitrators, the institutions, and the purpose-built arbitration centers that are springing up. For example, Maxwell Chambers in Singapore, an arbitration place, as it's called in Toronto, whose website refers to its concierge team, its Herman Miller air on chairs, and its urban woodland, described as cloud garden. I've not yet been there. Looking forward to that. Uh, as to its global credentials, arbitration is practiced by lawyers in international firms disregarding state borders or time zones. It's administered by institutions that welcome parties of any nationality without restriction regarding the location of the underlying dispute, the seat of the arbitration, or the physical siting of any arbitration hearing. An arbitration tribunal often comprises arbitrators of differing nationalities who are willing to apply whatever the governing law may be. I am, for example, involved in one arbitration where a German lawyer will be determining issues of Japanese law in a London-seated arbitration, and another where the interpretation of Uzbek law will be considered by Dutch and American lawyers. So international arbitration is a global privatized service industry. But the question I want to consider this evening is whether modern international arbitration has created now a world court. And from time to time, the creation of a world court has been called for. For example, nearly 30 years ago, Hans Smith, a Columbia Law School professor, identified as a towering figure in international arbitration, posed this question. The future of international commercial arbitration, a single transnational institution, question mark. He identified, and I quote, the rapidly increasing number of international arbitration institutions with different rules and processes administered by persons of different training and competence, which he reasoned failed effectively to serve the needs of international intercourse. His solution was to create, again I quote, a single international institution. More recently, John Templeman, a US-based arbitration practitioner, has proposed the creation of a permanent International Court of Arbitration. But notwithstanding the fact that we don't at the moment have a single institution, I think it's apt to consider whether modern international arbitration has sufficiently developed to create a de facto world court. Well, identifying what I mean by a world court is clearly imperative, and I, I will endeavour to take on that task. But I think a, a, a preliminary step is to confirm the international legitimacy of arbitration. For this, I need to dwell a little bit into its history. 
Arbitration has a rich history. It's worthy of a lecture on its own. It can be traced back to ancient Greece. It's referenced in Homer's Iliad, where it's employed as a means of resolving a blood dispute. Thereafter, from the Roman Empire, through the Middle Ages, arbitration was in regular use throughout Europe. There's evidence of arbitration being used more than 500 years before the rise of what we now know as the common law. And one legal historian explains that, and I quote, arbitration was perhaps the habitual mode of settling disputes among the Anglo-Saxons. Now, my purpose in presenting this historical background is not only to demonstrate the longevity of arbitration and its international roots, but to illustrate that historical features and perceived benefits of arbitration have persisted. Commenting on the advantage of arbitration, Demosthenes wrote of the ability of parties to select the arbitrator and the finality of an arbitration award. Modern day arbitration proponents frequently recite exactly those same features of arbitration. Similarly, in medieval England, arbitration provided merchants engaged in international trade with an efficient and comprehensible process for dispute resolution, which was welcomed by foreign parties who found the technicalities and inconsistencies of the common law confusing. In modern times, international commercial arbitration has therefore been described as, again I quote, the servant of international business and trade. Historically, however, arbitration was an ad hoc process. It would have been impossible to discern a world court from such a patchwork of ad hoc arbitrations. But, more recently, the development and growth of international arbitration has been driven by a number of global initiatives that have sought to develop a more cohesive international framework and to engender a consistency of process that appeals to parties. Now, singling out three key developments, indubitably a contentious exercise, I want to identify these three first. The 1958 New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, known to its friends as the New York Convention. 149 states are parties to the New York Convention. Its premise that an arbitral award rendered by a tribunal seated in one member state can be directly enforceable in another member state has been an enormously significant development in international arbitration. It's made arbitration effectively a global currency. With a single treaty, an arbitration award rendered in Azerbaijan is enforceable in Fiji, or 147 other states. And there's no doubt that the popularity of arbitration today is in part attributable to the success of the New York Convention. Second, the 1965 Washington International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes Convention, or commonly known as the ICSID Convention, was another landmark treaty that furthered the course of international arbitration, though in this case, specifically investment treaty arbitration, about which I'll have a few words to say later. But that convention established ICSID, an independent international institution which forms part of the World Bank Group. And though that convention doesn't of itself establish consent to arbitration, by signing it, 158 signatory states have demonstrated their commitment to resolving investment disputes that is to say, disputes by investors against the country in which they've invested by arbitration within an autonomous legal framework. Let me say a little bit more, because the ICSID Convention ushered in the era, in the era of invest, the investment treaty. By affording foreign investors substantive protections, such as the right to fair and equitable treatment, protection from unlawful expropriation, that they can directly enforce through arbitration against the host state of their investment, investment treaties have revolutionized the arbitration landscape. In 1965, there were only a handful of investment treaties. By the end of 2011, there were 2,833 separate bilateral investment treaties, each, of course, between two member states, supplemented with a number of free trade agreements, for example, NAFTA, DRCAFTA, and multilateral treaties, for example, the Energy Charter Treaty, all with investment chapters providing for international arbitration. Finally, the third of my developments, the establishment 
of the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, UNCITRAL, by the United Nations in 1966, with a general mandate to further the progressive harmonization and unification of the law of international trade. That, too, was a boon to international arbitration. That produced the UNCITRAL arbitration rules, first drafted in 1976, recently updated, which are often used for ad hoc arbitrations and are commonly referenced in arbitration clauses found both in commercial contracts and investment treaties. The 1985 UNCITRAL model law on international commercial arbitration provides a best practice model for states to adapt as an arbitration law in their own states and many countries, including up to a point this country, have done so. But beyond the practical implications of these treaties and these global initiatives, on which I'll say a little bit more later, these developments are significant because of the international legitimacy that they've conferred on arbitration. They demonstrate that states recognize that arbitration is an important and a valid dispute resolution forum. So from its historical background, it's incontrovertible that arbitration is both an illustrious international provenance and legitimacy. But of course, that in itself wouldn't be enough to satisfy my definition of a world court. So let me return, as I promised, to the question of what do I mean by a world court? Uh, that proposition doesn't mean judicial anarchy. It doesn't represent a rejection of national legal systems. As the eminent French arbitration professor and practitioner, Emmanuel Gaillard, observed when considering commercial arbitration as a transnational system of justice, the concept rests on arbitration being an autonomous legal order, not an a-national legal order. And whatever one's vision of arbitration, the source of its legitimacy ultimately derives from the states that have acknowledged it as a valid dispute resolution mechanism, for example, by signing up to the treaties that I've identified, such as the New York Convention. So what do I mean by referring to a world court? Well, first, I think it's necessary to consider the disputes that a body purporting to be a world court would determine. To a certain extent, it would have to meet thresholds as to the number and types of disputes that it resolves, a qualitative and a quantitative analysis. From a quantitative perspective, the number of disputes resolved by arbitration and the frequency of arbitration clauses provide data to determine whether arbitration is sufficiently prevalent to merit this world court badge. From a qualitative perspective, a world court must be adept at determining international and important disputes, whether measured by the financial amount or the principles at stake. But I think what's more, to elevate arbitration from merely a popular international and important dispute resolution mechanism to the status of world court requires consideration of what I will call the arbitration ecosystem. Uh, uh, as Gaillard, whom I've mentioned before, explained in the context of considering international arbitration as a system, what it connotes is that international arbitration can be, and I quote, viewed as a body of norms sufficiently organized, complete, and effective to qualify as a system. A patchwork of arbitrations, however extensive, can't claim to be a world court unless they can be linked to form an identifiable corpus. And the arbitration ecosystem, I would suggest, is the apparatus for developing those links. So what do I mean by ecosystem? I mean the framework under which arbitration exists, that includes the institutions that administer it, the applicable rules, the arbitrators, and the enforcement mechanisms that are integral to the arbitral pro process. Because without enforcement, an arbitration doesn't achieve its objective. I want to consider separately the contribution each makes to the proposition whether arbitration has created a world court. But I have no doubt that in order to do that, a primary requirement is that the ecosystem, as I've termed it, should be legitimate, cohesive, and autonomous. So let me start in a logical place of whether arbitration meets this quantitative threshold. 
I don't think the threshold is necessarily that high, but it must be possible to conclude that arbitration is seen as a legitimate alternative dispute for and by its potential users in a significant number of cases. Let me start with a non-scientific numerical analysis of the arbitrations administered by the larger arbitral institutions. In 2012, the International Chamber of Commerce registered nearly 800 cases. The London Court of International Arbitration, which as you'll hear is increasingly misnamed, registered nearly 300 cases. ICSID registered nearly 50, and the Singapore International Arbitration Centre, some two, just 250, and the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, these are the most popular arbitral institutions, and what's known as the AAA, which is the American Arbitration Association, uh, uh, nearly 1,000. But since many arbitrations last for more than a year, the fact that those cases were started in that year understates the caseload. And one trend reflected in the statistics of every single institution is an increase in the number of cases registered since the turn of the millennium. And those numbers aren't the full story, because some arbitrations, as I've said, are not administered by institutions at all. They're ad hoc arbitrations administered by the parties and their lawyers. And we don't know the number of those because they're mostly confidential, but it's likely they will be very significant. Now, having said that, those figures, one has to recognize, still are very much smaller than the number of cases started in the courts, for example, here uh, in 2011. Uh, 35,000 sets of proceedings or thereabouts were started in the Chancery Division and some 14,000 in the Queen's Bench Division. So perhaps more revealing is the incidence of arbitration clauses in contracts, in domestic legislation and in international treaties. Again, it's difficult to be clear and to be sure about the number of these because the contracts in question are often confidential. But to take one example, the SEC, the Securities and Exchanges Commission, uh, has uh, contracts which are filed with them by U.S. public companies. And in 2002, a study, show, a study showed that on average 20% of all the contracts filed included an international party uh, and an arbitration clause. And more recently, another U.S. study highlighted that 71% of SEC filed international joint venture agreements in 2008 contained arbitration clauses. That seems to indicate that important contracts where an international party is involved regularly, perhaps almost always, include an arbitration clause. And there's also what's been termed arbitration without privity, where the claimant actually doesn't need a contractual relationship with the defendant at all. So this may be contained in, for example, domestic investment legislation. The legislation of Georgia, Albania, and El Salvador have been found to include binding arbitration clauses. And other states' domestic legislation contain reference to arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism. That's complemented by the vast network of investment treaties that mostly include provision for the direct enforcement of their protection by means of investor state arbitration. A word on that, that regularly is taken to mean that an offer in a treaty between country A and country B, that a citizen or a company in country B can start an international arbitration against country A, takes the form almost of a unilateral contact, a, a unilateral contract, forgive me. And those arbitrations significantly extend the reach of arbitration because the state is consenting to arbitration in relation to a potentially indeterminate class of disputants. It's compounded by the fact that they're often binding for significant periods of time. Uh, and certainly in the context of treaties, during that period are not subject to the supervision or control of any electoral mechanisms. So the tribunals whose jurisdiction is founded on such clauses effectively exercise compulsory jurisdiction. On the international plane, arbitration provisions are not confined to investment treaties. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea provides for the resolution of disputes pertaining to its interpretation or application by arbitration, although not exclusively. And I'll say something more about that also later. So on the basis of that 
brief and necessarily incomplete analysis, I think it's fair to say that arbitration is sufficiently popular to conclude that it's regarded as a legitimate alternative dispute resolution mechanism in a significant number of cases for resolving at least international disputes involving private parties and involving states. Let me turn to a qualitative analysis of the disputes resolved by arbitration, because my designation world court must imply a certain status requiring arbitration to resolve important international disputes. So let me look at the arbitration credentials in relation to international disputes, in relation to high-value disputes, and disputes concerning issues of public policy. Well, arbitration's relevance as a means of resolving international disputes, for example, by which I mean disputes involving parties from different states, is widely recognised. Uh, from my own experience, I can attest to the truly international nature of arbitration. Arbitration is obviously particularly suitable for international disputes where the parties seek a neutral forum, and in particular, where the parties may not have confidence in the courts of the other party's home state. And the flexibility of arbitration means the parties can choose the location for any oral hearings, the applicable substantive law, and the seat of the arbitration, which supplies the procedural legal framework. Maybe a reason why some places which have good hotels and are close to the beach are quite popular in international arbitration. In addition, the global enforcement uh, regime supplied by the New York Convention makes arbitration a particularly effective dispute resolution mechanism where the parties have assets worldwide, so you may want to enforce your judgment in goodness knows which countries. What about the value of arbitrations? Well, it's well suited for high-value disputes. It's one of the reasons that the confidential nature of arbitration is appreciated, because it may keep that sort of secret, that sort of detail secret. But arbitration does spawn big awards. Uh, there's a US arbitration commentator called Michael Goldharper who produces something called the, uh, the American Law Daily Arbitration Scorecard. He, he subtitles it, The Biggest Cases You Never Heard Of. A billion here, a billion there, pretty soon it adds up to a real justice system. End of title. And now that scorecard in 2011 identified 113 billion dollar arbitration cases. It identified 261 cases that fulfilled the criteria of either being an investment treaty case for at least hundred million dollars or a commercial dispute for at least 500 million dollars. One example of a recent high value award is a 1.8 billion dollar award recently awarded to Occidental Petroleum in an arbitration against Ecuador. Even more breathtaking is the amount claimed in the dispute between the shareholders of UCOS Oil against the Russian Federation in relation to the expropriation of their investment. They state that the compensation they claim exceeds $114 billion. Well, with numbers like that, arbitration can certainly lay claim to resolving disputes with significant financial amounts. What about disputes concerning issues of public policy. Arbitration as a suitable forum for resolving international and high-value disputes might enable it to pass the qualitative threshold, but also determining issues of major public policy would add to that credential. Now, a fundamental premise of arbitration is it doesn't impinge on the rights of third parties. The consensual nature of arbitration means that the only people who are bound by an arbitration award are the parties to the arbitration. That's the consequence of this being a privatised system of law, but it would be naive to dismiss the broader implications of arbitration awards. And in particular, the increasing use of arbitration for disputes involving states means that arbitral decisions can impact millions of people. And there are strong arguments for believing that the jurisprudence which comes from these arbitrations is also influencing the policy considerations and the conduct of national states. We turn to examine that under the heading of investor state arbitration. An arbitration in which 
a, a company or an individual which has made an investment is claiming against the state it's been treated in breach of the provisions, it's been unlawfully expropriated, or it's not been treated fairly. Now, the requirement that a state comply with its international law obligations, the principle that domestic law can't cover that, is not new. But the exponential growth of investment treaty arbitration has fundamentally changed the landscape for states. So, as I've said, investment treaties are designed to afford comfort to foreign investors by providing them direct recourse, direct recourse, through arbitration against a state that breaches the treaty's substantive protections. What used once upon a time to be protection that was provided by diplomatic me methods or going even further back by the use of military force is now provided through the use of international arbitration. But it's highly unlikely that many states, when they entered into, certainly at least the earlier investment treaties, envisaged that they would encroach upon their freedom to act in their domestic space in quite the way that they have. And investors have become savvy, perhaps I should say investors' lawyers have become savvy, at invoking investment treaties to protect their investments in really quite a wide variety of cases. Taxation policy, environmental regulations, license allocations. It's also been used to challenge the state's omissions, such as a state's failure to afford adequate protection to an investment during periods of civil unrest, or even its failure to provide sufficient regulatory oversight. For example, letters of notice, which is the, as it were, letter before action in an investment treaty case, have been sent to the US by foreign investors who were stung by Alan Stanford's Ponzi scheme, and they allege lax oversight by the SEC. There are other examples. For example, the tobacco companies in Australia are arguing that the plain packaging legislation in Australia introduced to protect people's health uh, uh, amount to an indirect expropriation of their intellectual property rights and they're pursuing an investment treaty claim on that basis. But there are obviously, in the current economic climate, even bigger issues that are at stake. Uh, Argentina's decision to devalue the peso amidst its economic collapse in 2001 meant it was deluged by more than 30 claims for an estimated value of more than $17 billion. And more recently, the restructuring of Greek debt as a result of the euro crisis is likely to generate investment treaty claims. So the advent of investment treaty arbitration has had an enormous impact on how states exercise their public authority. And it's been argued that investment treaty jurisprudence therefore reflects the emergence of an international administrative law, a public law that regulates the conduct of states through a private adjudicative system. In contrast to commercial arbitration awards, many investment treaty awards are public. They're not kept confidential, they are published. And so there is a growing jurisprudence which will develop into a body of supranational law. And that's expanded the sphere of influence of those awards, not only to the parties to the dispute, or even to parties of similar future disputes, but arguably has broadly influenced states' conduct. There's actually no formal precedence value like a court's decision has in arbitration decisions, but there's a growing common vocabulary for example, what is meant by fair and equitable treatment. And tribunals are understandably swayed by previous reasoned awards, not least, as I'll say in a moment, as many of the same arbitrators sit in one panel after another. So investor-state arbitration, though relatively small in number, has an enormous impact on states. But there's also arbitration directly between states. Now that's used, for example, to settle law of the sea disputes, including maritime delimitation disputes. These are obviously extraordinarily important. The UNCLOS Treaty, United Nations uh, uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea, which I mentioned before, identifies four dispute resolution mechanisms, one of which is known as the Annex 7 arbitration. And that's because, surprisingly, it's contained in Annex 7 to the Convention. Now, that's been used predominantly in the context of maritime delimitation, 
it, it dissolved, resolved a maritime dispute between Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago, uh, uh, one in which Barbadian fishermen were very, very interested. Uh, it's, there's an, an Annex 7 tribunal has uh, rendered a decision in Guyana and Suriname which delimits the state's boundaries, again, mostly equidistant line between them. Uh, and in that case, uh, the parties were acutely aware of the valuable national resources at stake. Uh, indeed, a dispute over a drilling rig was a catalyst for the arbitration. Uh, there are currently four pending Annex 7 arbitrations. Uh, one, the Philippines and China, is particularly noteworthy because China's resolutely declared it's opted out of the UNCLOS compulsory dispute resolution mechanism and so has declined to participate in the proceedings. Nonetheless, the litany of requests from the Philippines, including a declaration that China's maritime claims in the South China Sea are contrary to the convention, directly challenge these important and topical claims uh, of China to the South China Sea. Uh, in the Argentina and Ghana arbitration, one can see the relevance of Annex 7 arbitrations to third parties because in that case, Argentina is seeking a declaration that Ghana's actions in detaining an Argentinian warship were unlawful. Uh, and that was because the Ghanaian Commercial Court had ordered the detention after a commercial company, NML Catley, uh, Capital, one of Argentina's judgment creditors, had been chasing Argentina's assets around the globe and filed suit as soon as the ship docked in Ghana. Let me just give you one example closer to home, which illustrates the very uh, political nature of some of these cases, despite the apparently technical uh, and sterile nature of, of many things with arbitration. The Mauritius and United Kingdom arbitration, which is the fourth of the current ones, was initiated by Mauritius, apparently to try to resolve at least part of the long-standing dispute regarding the Chagos Archipelago uh, in the heart of the Indian Ocean. So this tribunal has been asked to resolve title to the archipelago, determine the validity of the United Kingdom designation of a significant proportion of the area as a marine protected area. But as many will understand, uh, that is an interesting example of an arbitral tribunal dealing with a matter which is actually of great political importance uh, because many here may recall that the question of the rights of the Chagos Islanders, the position of Diego Garcia, had been the subject both of political controversy and indeed disputes going up to our own House of Lords in this country. So the use of arbitration to settle that sort of dispute illustrates the role of arbitration in determining public policy issues. So let me turn, if I may, then to what I described as the arbitration ecosystem. What do we see there? Because that's got the possibility of elevating arbitration from a patchwork of miscellaneous dispute resolution mechanisms into a much more cohesive system. Let me then consider uh, some of the issues that arise there, one of which is the question of international institutions. Now, I've already mentioned that there are a number of international institutions which administer arbitrations. Some of them date back to the late 19th century, but the institutions in their modern guise appeared much more recently than that. And the relevance of these institutions is often in the role that they play in harmonizing globally arbitration practice. Now, the services offered by these institutions do vary to some extent. In general, though, they provide a body of arbitration rules which provides a default structure to the proceedings. Parties can agree their own procedure, but often the institution's rules provide, as I say, that default mechanism. Uh, the institution may be involved in the appointment process of the tribunals, uh, either because the parties ask them to, or because there is a default by one party uh, in appointment, a role which otherwise courts nationally often perform. And the institution's personnel often help with practicalities such as arbitrators' fees, which is quite an important topic. Um, and although many of these institutions have a geographical element in their name, 
the London Court of International Arbitration, the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Centre. This is actually misleading. The London Court of International Arbitration now has outposts in New Delhi, Dubai and Mauritius. The ICC has offices in Paris and Hong Kong. And the institution's names are actually just a nod to the location of their headquarters. And they don't restrict their services to parties located in those centres. And they don't even determine what the seat, which is a legal, an important legal concept, is for the arbitration. And the institutions themselves are absolutely at pains to tout their international credentials. The LCIA, the London Court of International Arbitration, highlights that it will administer proceedings, and I quote, regardless of location and under any system of law. You can't get more general than that. Uh, and it boasts that typically more than 75 of the cases referred to it involve no United Kingdom and therefore no London parties at all. Uh, the ICC says that in 2012 it received requests for arbitration from parties in 137 countries and the place of lo arbitration located in 59 countries. Arbitration nationalities uh, for, the, for the arbitrators who were appointed with some 76 different countries. So the international outlook of arbitration is important because of the impact it has on the practice of arbitration. So although a London-based lawyer may often advocate, let's go to the London Court of International Arbitration, or a Singapore lawyer may be a proponent for the Singapore International Arbitration Centre, if you look at their websites, all of them will boast the ability to plead in each of those institutions and to be familiar with the rules of all of the major arbitral institutions. I've already made the point that many arbitrations are actually administered on an ad hoc basis. But having said that, the institutions, even though they don't govern those arbitrations, have generally enhanced the practice of ad hoc arbitrations because in those ad hoc arbitrations, where the procedures are set by agreement, very often the parties and their lawyers will choose what is in effect the rules which apply to one of these well-known institutions. And institutional arbitrations are becoming increasingly important. Let me turn then to the question of the rules which apply. Because if there were a world court, it ought to have some sort of common procedural framework. So in order to argue that de facto there is a world court, one would need to show some transnational procedural rules that provide some consistency between arbitrations. Now there are two tiers for procedural rules, the arbitration itself uh, and the seat of the arbitration. Let, let's concentrate on the procedural rules of the arbitration so those are chosen consensually by the parties and they may specify in their arbitration agreement particular rules to apply, either a ready-made package of rules or rules that they are, have tailor-made for their case. And the institution's rules, which would be the ready-made package, can be an important factor when selecting the appropriate institution. So you'd think that the distinction between the different rules of the different institutions would be important. And there are some differences. For example, ICC arbitrations are all scrutinised by the ICC court to a certain extent. But if you examine the rules of the institutions, you will find that there is an, actually a growing convergence between the institution's rules. Perhaps that's not surprising. These arbitration institutions actually operate in a competitive marketplace too. And therefore, they all seek to accommodate the preferences of the parties and the councils who may use their services. And each arbitration's rules are generally developed by arbitration practitioners who've experience of conducting arbitrations under other rules. So they're quite well placed to identify best practices and incorporate them into that institution's system. Indeed, in some cases, it's actually the same lawyers who are drawing up the rules of different institutions. Let me just give you one example of how these have converged. In 2007, 
the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution revised its rules to provide for what it called interim measures of protection by a special arbitrator. That's a sort of emergency arbitrator who can come in before the arbitral tribunal has been constituted to give emergency relief, the sort of thing that you'd be rushing off to court to get otherwise. Well, they introduced that in 2007. By 2009, similar provisions were adopted by the International Centre for Dispute Resolution, and other institutions have been rushing, been racing to follow suit, and many procedural rules now contain what is in fact exactly the same emergency arbitrator provision. Until the beginning of this month, and indeed if I'd stopped the drafting at the beginning of this month, I would have said there are two institutions which are conspicuous by the fact that they don't contain emergency arbitrator provisions, the LCIA and the Hong Kong International Arbitration Centre. But on the 12th of June, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Centre published its new rules, and yes, they do include emergency arbitrator provisions. We're waiting for the LCIA rules. An example I'm saying of convergence, so one doesn't actually see this competitive difference so much between the rules, but one sees a growing convergence and a growing similarity between them. And there are lots of other examples in the rules of the same principles applying. Now, there are, in addition to the arbitration institution's rules, there are more specific rules where the parties can elect whether they should apply. The International Bar Association is particularly noted for the publication of such materials. For example, it produces guidelines to address the practical problems that arise with an international dispute resolution mechanism. Bear in mind, you've then got lawyers from different jurisdictions, from different legal cultures, applying their own national ideas. That creates confusion. And the IBA has produced a number of guidelines. That's all they are. They're guidelines. They have no force of law. Guidelines on conflicts of interest, guidelines on the rules for evidence. But they're often adopted wholesale in an arbitration. And a 2012 study of international arbitration found that these rules were used in 60% of arbitrations, either as binding rules or, more frequently, described as guidelines. And even where the IBA's guidelines are not expressly incorporated uh, into the proceedings, it's likely that counsel and the arbitrators will use them as a guide to how they should determine issues which come before them. There are other examples of similar uh, processes. Something's grown up called the Redfern Schedule, which is now commonly used in arbitration. The point I'm making is none of these are mandated by any parliament or supranational legislature they're all things which have grown up in the arbitration community but are common to so many different arbitrations. So they are becoming increasingly harmonised. The parties also will be concerned by what the seat of arbitration is because different rules apply. That means the legal place where the arbitration is deemed to be conducted. Uh, you can have a seat in IC Reykjavik while still sitting in Bermuda, so it doesn't actually affect the venue, may not affect the venue. Uh, and here too, there's been a convergence, let me summarise it very shortly, summarise it, that there's been a convergence between national rules as to what happens at the seat of the arbitration, uh, uh, which uh, induced in part by the development I referred to before, the UNCITRAL development, the UNCITRAL model law. But what about the arbitrators? Because if one was thinking of a court, not perhaps as a physical place, but as, as, as the Oxford English Dictionary defines it, a body of people presided over by a judge acting as a tribunal in civil and criminal cases. So one would assume if there was a world court, one would have a standing international judiciary. Do we have that? Well, not in quite those terms. Uh, indeed, the core distinction between arbitration and legal proceedings is you appoint your arbitrators whereas the judges are appointed for you. So one might think there can't be a standing body of international arbitrators. That would actually be a premature conclusion. Because when one close, more closely analyses it, one sees there's something which looks absolutely like a standing body of lawyers, like a standing judiciary. Now, first of all, the various institutions generally have a roster of arbitrators, practitioners who they will use for the appointments that the institution makes. But even beyond that, in reality, there's a relatively small pool of arbitrators 
who determine at least the most important commercial and investment treaty arbitrations. This arbitration elite, which has been unflatteringly described as a cartel, a club, a mafia, or even in one case a series of 800-pound guerrillas, dominate tribunals, and this is seen by some as problematic. And it's a function of international arbitration that parties tend to appoint big-name arbitrators who they think will be influential in the deliberations which takes place in the tribunal to which they're appointed. So the existence of this arbitration elite might be thought to lend weight to the claim that arbitration has developed into a world court. I turn then to the question of the enforcement mechanism because that is critically important. And I've talked already about the New York Convention which provides a global enforcement mechanism. Please just contrast that, I've indicated so many states belong to that and enforce arbitral awards with the attempts that have been made to create a system for the enforcement of foreign judgments. The Hague Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Judgments in Civil and Commercial Matters was concluded in 1971, but has only entered into force for Albania, Cyprus, Kuwait, the Netherlands, and Portugal. That's all. Whereas I told you the hundred and odd countries that recognize arbitral awards. And so there's much more suspicion of national courts than there is of international arbitration. That is why many international clients will say, we'll have an arbitration. It's much more likely we can enforce that than if we go to our national court or indeed your national court. The ICSID awards, which are investment awards, uh, those also are enforced pursuant to a convention. And they enjoy the benefit of therefore being enforceable worldwide. And there is a very restrictive right for national courts to revise those decisions. So there's a finality about those awards which adds to the attraction of arbitration as a dispute mechanism. So let me just try to bring this to, 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 to answer my question. Does international arbitration, having regard to these features, therefore amount to a world court? In my view, the developments I've identified go a long way to providing a yes answer. And even though the single institution, which Hans Smith, whom I mentioned at the beginning, hasn't materialized, the system we're now using provides, in fact and practice, much of what he wanted to achieve. So the increasing international institutionalization of arbitration, the structures that provides, together with the growing convergence of the procedural framework, has contributed to its overall cohesiveness, the small pool of arbitrators, the pool of mafiosi guerrillas also adds to that image. And as the arbitration community continues to refine the system, the legitimacy of this as a world court will be enhanced. And the process is not reversing. I can tell you it's continuing. Let me just single out, as I bring to a, this to a conclusion, four possible future developments that if they were come about would advance the idea of a world court even more. First, one of the problems with international arbitration at the moment is there is a lack of a fully harmonized approach to the ethical standards that underpin any dispute resolution system. By which I mean every lawyer has a set of ethical rules but they're different from country to country. Which rule as to professional privilege, which rule as to contact with witnesses, which rule as to disclosure of documents to apply if one side is represented by New York lawyers and others by Greek lawyers? These are very important issues, and uh, there have been attempts to resolve that. The Council of the Bars of, and Law Societies of Europe uh, made a supranational code of conduct for European lawyers, but that doesn't really go far enough or into much enough detail. Uh, in 2010, a Arbitration practitioner Doak Bishop presented a draft code of ethics uh, for lawyers at an international conference. And his request for there to be a true international code of ethics for arbitration practitioners may have started to receive uh, an answer because the International Bar Association then established a task force on council ethics and very recently it published what it calls the guidelines on party representation. 
If those are successful, they deal with how lawyers should operate, uh, they may well go a long way to addressing that problem. Secondly, the question of the appointment of arbitrators has led to concerns about the current process. Are you always getting fully independent arbitrators if they're appointed in part by the parties? And there are two very well-known arbitration figures, Jan Paulsen and Albert Jan Vandenberg. They've been vocal critics of this system. They've proposed that to avoid what they call the moral hazard associated with party-appointed arbitrators, any arbitrator should actually either be jointly chosen or selected by an institution. One can see where that would go if it were to be accepted. The institutions would have their lists of people from whom they would appoint and you would be, really find it difficult to distinguish that from a standing body of judges who could be chosen to determine a case in the commercial court or in the Corte di Cassazione in Milan. Third, the New York Convention, which I've referred to as the bedrock of international arbitration, uh, uh, is not perfect. It has deficiencies and holes. But there's therefore um, a growing movement to produce a revised draft convention which will... Uh, which will better serve modern international arbitration by curing some of those defects uh, and defaults. For example, the New York Convention provides that you can refuse to enforce an arbitration award on grounds of public policy. But who's public policy? What does public policy mean? Is the public policy in London the same as the public policy in Washington or Paris or Athens? And so the idea of building a body of public international public policy uh, is growing. Fourthly, in order to strengthen the uh, autonomy and legitimacy of arbitration, a supranational body could act as an appellate mechanism. That would be the most radical development. Uh, no doubt it would require an international treaty to establish it or something of that sort, but uh, if an appellate mechanism of that sort were to come about, you really would then find that the national involvement in arbitration would be so minimal that you could properly describe this as a world court. This particular idea has been mooted in academic circles for years. Now, whether or not, let me conclude, whether or not those particular developments come to pass, I predict that the enthusiasm and the energy of the arbitration community to create a global dispute resolution system means that in five to ten years, a future speaker on this topic, standing perhaps at this lectern, will be able to answer this question actually with an unqualified yes. International arbitration has now created a world court. minutes uh, for questions if, and there's a microphone if you could use that and um, perhaps say who you are when asking the question. Uh, my name is Joshua Rosenberg. Do you see the growth of arbitration, your world court, as a threat to the domestic courts, the courts of this country, for the reasons you were saying that people, large corporations, prefer to arbitrate rather than litigate, it's more enforceable, private, has other advantages, or do you see this as an opportunity uh, for the courts in this country, which are currently looking around for ways of making money, not just in hiring out their premises for arbitrations, but even in providing judges, serving judges, to sit as arbitrators? Uh, do you see this as a way in which uh, the domestic courts can fight back your guerrillas and your uh, international arbitrators and so on, and offer a service um, which uh, will bring in some much needed revenue to the courts of this country. Uh, Joshua, thank you. I mean, I, th th there's, a, there's a difference between domestic disputes and international disputes in that there's a much greater need for an arbitration system in international disputes because you avoid the problem of fighting on someone else's territory. Nobody likes to play an away game. Uh, and that deals with that, particularly if you don't trust the other side's crowd or its courts. Uh, but having said that, I mean, there are advantages in arbitration which go beyond that. We actually have provision 
under the English legislation for commercial judges to sit as arbitrators. I've certainly had one example of that, uh, where the advantages of secrecy, confidential, confidentiality, I should say, rather than secrecy, which sounds very sinister, confidentiality, uh, and perhaps also speed, meant it was, it was desirable to have the expertise of an excellent English commercial judge, but actually doing it through an arbitration. And obviously there are a lot of domestic arbitrations in, in, in other fields, but uh, given that at the moment, certainly here, there are uh, moves towards getting more money for the courts, uh, charging more for the cases, um, having an economic rent, as no doubt the present Lord Chancellor would say, uh, he will find that he will then be competing with the truly private ar arbitral process. And when you have a choice between a process where you're paying for both of them, one of them is the national judicial system and the other is a, a well-developed, uh, perhaps international, but still arbitral system, it may be that some will vote with their feet and go for the fully private system. Michael Butcher, uh, about a quarter of the world are Muslims. Uh, what percentage of, of the Islam-related peoples and states actually currently form part of this ecosystem to which you allude, and are they part of a world court system? Um, this, it's a very good question. Uh, I can't give you the precise statistic, of course, but there's more than you would think. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, in the Gulf, uh, in Dubai, there are actually two international arbitration centers in Dubai, one of which is attached to the International Financial Center, which operates English law, but the other is not, uh, which has uh, Emirati judges, Emirati arbitrators, and they have a thriving arbitration business. Indeed, I think in a number of these countries, the concept of arbitration is actually a very common and familiar one. Uh, and um, in, um, in, in many of the disputes that they will be concerned with, um, Arbitration offers considerable advantages precisely because it's a more consensual process, um, it's private. You have other issues, no doubt, in relation to how you run them, but I never heard uh, any, any, any uh, fundamental objections uh, on philosophical or religious grounds to arbitration from, uh, from Muslim countries. And I have, w when I go to international conferences involving uh, on arbitration, there will often be some people there who have that background or, or, or who come from those countries. Yes, Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey Nice, a short question on uh, guaranteeing the quality of performance of arbitrators. Uh, domestic judges' performance is guaranteed by increasingly rigorous selection systems and supervision by appellate courts, government, parliament, and most important by the press. From your description, little of that can be replicated in the international arbitration world. Can you help? Well, now, here's, here's an answer I'm going to give you, which coming from a Labour politician you will find un, unattractive. It's market forces. Because, because the arbitrators are chosen by the parties, uh, then they have to command respect, at least with the party that appoints them. Um, I can tell you, whenever we have to choose an arbitral tribunal in an important case, uh, we will know the people that we're concerned with, we will know their reputation, we will ask colleagues, partners, uh, uh, how these particular arbitrators operate. Uh, and that can affect the judgment. Now, you may get it wrong, but you won't appoint that person again. Um, you don't have quite the same possibility in court, although Jeffrey, you and I will know that from time to time we wished that we could say when we turned up the court doors, sorry, can I have somebody else? <laughs> so, but it's a, it's a very fair point, but I think that, that, I think that's, that's, that is the answer to it. And, and because the arbitration community, the practitioners who practice, um, you know, it's quite a, it's a, it's a very chatty um, organization, I mean, pretty com competitive, but people do therefore talk and, uh, and, and, and try to uh, maintain those standards. And then there are a series of, of uh, conferences and events that take place where people also do training, which is another part of it. <laughs> 
Yes, perhaps one final question at the back. If one or both parties aren't happy with the uh, arbitration, is there a, an appeal mechanism? Well, now that, that depends, it depends on a couple of things. It will normally depend upon the rules of the seat, the place where the arbitration is legally cited. Um, the, most countries, those countries which have adopted the model law, what I refer to the UNCITRAL model law, have restricted rights of appeal. The idea is that courts shouldn't really intervene if parties have decided arbitration. They've decided it in order to get the decision from the arbitrators, not from the courts. And indeed, uh, in, in, in commerce, there's often a view, um, actually what matters is getting a decision. And it's not whether the decision is correct. And so we don't want, they will say, to be able to go to the Court of Appeal and the House of Lords or the Court of Cassation, whatever it may be. But there are limited rights of appeal, some of which will apply in different circumstances, some not. For example, in international arbitration, the rights to appeal in the English courts will generally be excluded by agreement between the parties, whether they realise it or not, because that's what they're signing up to when they sign up to certain institutions, except in particular issues, cases like the jurisdiction of the court. Now, having said that, once the decision has been made and it then comes to enforcement of the decision, then that may be taken to the place where the assets of the unlucky loser um, are. And then there may be further attempts to challenge the award by saying this award is not enforceable. I referred before to the public policy exception that this award is against public policy or this arbitral tribunal didn't have jurisdiction over me. So there are some exceptions. Not, it's, sorry, it's not, it's not uniform. It'll depend upon a number of factors. But generally speaking, the whole idea is you choose arbitration, you're choosing a decision by the arbitrators, not a decision by the courts. I think we should uh, conclude, but I see that I think we've rain has not yet come, so we can go out into the courtyard and continue the discussion over a drink. But may I, on your behalf, thank Lord Goldsmith very much indeed for maintaining the quality of the Gray's Inn lectures, mm. if I can make a judgment from a completely different discipline. Uh, a fascinating lecture and, and one obviously about a very important um, development in international and indeed domestic jurisdiction. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.